In 1950, the streets of San Francisco were more vibrant than ever. After the end of World War II, high spirits swept the Bayside City. A culture of dazzling nightlife and picturesque families sprung up in the background of the baby boom and a prospering economy. However, the ideal conditions for most in this period were merely a glamorous facade for non-conforming communities. In the face of deep-rooted homophobia, strong gender roles, and a societal emphasis on uniformity, the 1950s proved to be especially difficult for homosexuals. Referred to as sexual deviants and classified as psychologically disordered because of their identities, queer individuals were met with widespread discrimination and punishment, which often turned violent. Unjust policy across the country operated under the guise of anti-sodomy law, and penalties for same-sex relations or even cohabitation could range from high fines to lengthy prison sentences. A range of factors contributed to this era of non-acceptance and hypervigilance, including the rise of McCarthyism, rousing widespread suspicion of individuals who deviated from societal norms. Gay, lesbian, and gender non-conforming people were seen as a threat to the rigid masculine and feminine molds idealized in this period. For these reasons, homosexual life was largely conducted underground and out of sight until San Francisco's first queer organizations emerged in the mid-1950s. Initially called the Homophile Movement, the first gay and lesbian rights activists quietly formed secretive support groups out of homes and businesses, particularly bars. Popular gay bars, such as the Black Cat and Tommy's Place, served as spaces for socializing and camaraderie away from the everyday prejudices of the 1950s. However, these protective establishments were often threatened by targeted militancy, including police raids and arrests. By 1956, most of San Francisco's gay and lesbian bars had been forced to close because of newly elected Mayor George Christopher's so-called anti-vice policies. In the midst of this decline, many sought alternative ways of finding community and comfort to ease the burden of public and internalized homophobia. Despite such oppressive conditions in the mid-20th century, Influential gay organizations first took root in rapidly growing urban hubs. One group in particular, the Daughters of Belitis, originated as a small social gathering between lesbians, but grew to become a larger network with branches across the nation. Founded in 1955, the Daughters of Belitis provided a safe space for lesbians to express their identities, free from social scrutiny in the increasingly dangerous gay bar scene. Formalized by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, a lesbian couple in the San Francisco area, the Daughters created a non-profit establishment that connected closeted women throughout the country. In a period when women were expected to be homemakers, childbearers, and to submit to men, Martin and Lyon forged a new frontier of support for lesbians and women who didn't fit the mold. With branches in California, Boston, and New York, the organization sought to spread understanding and awareness to those questioning their identities, most prominently through their publication of a magazine called The Ladder. In its run from 1956 to 1972, the magazine included vital information about community events, political opinion pieces, updates on the status of gay civil rights, and reader-submitted works, from short stories to poetry and art. With over 4,000 readers at its peak, the latter was the first form of national lesbian media and helped to cultivate a unified identity. As the publication matured, their content shifted to cover more openly political viewpoints while maintaining a presentable yet conservative image to society. A prominent figure responsible for this change was Kayla Husson, a photojournalist and one of the Daughters' most accomplished members. Under her direction, the latter began printing photos, rather than drawings, of lesbians for the first time in 1964. The publication of these photos was an important step towards lesbian visibility across the country. Lehusen's partner, Barbara Giddings, was also instrumental to the development of the latter. Through her work as a senior editor and activist within the organization, Giddings pushed the publication in a more radical direction, advocating for an end to the stigma surrounding lesbianism. The popularity of the latter was responsible for much of the success of the Daughters, cementing itself as a cornerstone of the organization. As a whole, the Daughters of Belitis stood out from other activism groups in the 1950s. Almost all other activism in the period was centered on the rights of gay men, establishing the Daughters as trailblazers for women nationwide. Pioneering a strategy for lesbian self-acceptance and artistic expression, they laid the foundation for future gay activism in the latter half of the 20th century. The Daughters partnered with the Council on Religion and the Homosexual, a progressive San Francisco-based church organization, to extend their message of community and reassurance to a wider audience. The two groups held conferences affirming acceptance of homosexuality in local religious settings, which helped to connect the ideologies of two seemingly opposing groups. 
The Daughters of Elitis also collaborated with established gay men's advocacy groups, most notably the Mattachine Society. The Society, although a vital organization for the gay rights movement, focused heavily on the agendas of men, mirroring the patriarchal structure of the 20th century. Through published efforts, the Daughters of Belitis exposed the marginalization of lesbians within the gay activist community and society at large. Cooperation between the two groups was short-lived for this reason, as they clashed in their approaches to gay activism. While the Daughters of Belitis took a more cautious, individualist stance through media, the Manichean Society promoted more radical ideas of widespread social change with protests and demonstrations. Throughout its 16-year existence, the Daughters of Belitis maintained a conservative stance on the role of lesbians within American society, limiting opportunities for self-expression. For example, founders Lyon and Martin taught women how to disguise their identities and assimilate with heterosexual norms. Their traditionalism caused divisions within the organization. As the Daughters reached a wider audience, their membership shifted to include younger activists who were unsatisfied with the passivity of the club's values. These members transplanted ideas from the Mattachine Society and began more vocal efforts to fight for their rights, including protests. In particular, the 1965 Annual Reminder for Gay Rights Protests in Philadelphia, led by Barbara Giddings and Mattachine Society members, demonstrated the schism in the membership base of the Daughters. The ideological rift drew more drastic action from some key members, including Daughters of Elitist President Rita Laporte. Increasingly frustrated by the group's complacency, Laporte took matters into her own hands by stealing the latter's mailing list in 1970. Because the magazine, a crucial source of funds and outreach for the nonprofit, was no longer associated with the organization, the Daughters of Elitist soon fell into destitution. Unable to survive division and high tensions, the organization collapsed in 1970, leaving behind both a legacy and an opening to be filled as their frontier came to an end. Coinciding with the Stonewall Riots of 1969, which were prompted by the violent police raids conducted on gay bars in New York City, the gap left by the Daughters of Belitis was filled by a new wave of diverse, open-minded activists and organizations. Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, two participants in the Stonewall Riots, rose to prominence in this new environment. As both people of color and transgender activists, they guided the movement in a more progressive direction. Through their foundation of the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries in 1970, known as STAR, the two women emphasized the hardships faced by groups not represented in predominantly white, middle-class, gender-conforming organizations, such as the Daughters of Elitis. Johnson and Rivera established STAR House, a safe space for gay and transgender youth in New York. This significantly contrasted with the conformist efforts of gay activism in the previous two decades that characterized the Daughters of Belitis. Further, the progress of the 1970s and 80s gave rise to previously suppressed lesbian voices. Two San Francisco artists, Merle Wu and Bernice Bing, promoted intersectional discussions of race, gender, and sexuality through their prolific works. Expanding on the media-centered efforts favored by the Daughters of Belitis, this new generation of activists sprung from the foundations established by previous generations' as struggle. The fight continued into the 21st century as the gay rights movement began to gain political traction. Making headlines, San Francisco became the first city in the United States to legalize same-sex marriage in 2004. However, this right was stripped away within one month by conservative opposition as the California Supreme Court voided early licenses. Subsequent cases in 2008 and 2013 reestablished the right to same-sex marriage, but progress wasn't nationwide until the passage of the 2015 Supreme Court decision confirming the protections of same-sex marriage, justified by the 14th Amendment. In recent years, harmful legislation has been introduced across the country opposing these monumental strides towards equality, especially targeting non-conforming youth. Still, despite these setbacks, activists continue to make progress, most notably with the passage of the Respect for Marriage Act in 2022, safeguarding the right to marriage regardless of race or sex. Although the era of prominence for the Daughters of Belitis has long passed, their impact can still be felt through the foundation built by their initial steps towards lesbian visibility. Pioneering the first lesbian rights movement in the 20th century, the Daughters played a vital role in establishing a truly safe space for lesbians across the United States. Their legacy, although flawed, is no less relevant today. The efforts of the Daughters of Belitis enabled future activists and organizations to ascend the rungs towards equality on the ladder they built.